The Trumpet Daily Program begins right now. Hello, welcome to The Trumpet Daily. I'm Brent Nuktagal. Today, filling in for Mr. Stephen Flurry. This is my first time in a while doing this, and uh, Richard assures me. Um, well, he doesn't assure me, but he told me that this is his first time in a year that he's on the board. So you guys uh, will see how we go uh, with today's program. Thank you very much to Mr. Stephen Flurry for allowing me to take today's show. Uh, we are going to be looking back uh, about 30 years to the life of Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Herbert Armstrong. We talk about him quite a lot. He's the, the founder, uh, really, of the Philadelphia Church of God, or at least the, the Worldwide Church of God that the Philadelphia Church of God came out of. He's the editor-in-chief, or was, of the Plain Truth magazine that had a massive circulation going to so many people that Mr. Stephen Flurry talks about quite a lot which then the trumpet carries on that same mission. And he also did a lot of work in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem itself is in the news again. Massive peace deals are being worked out uh, with the help of President Donald Trump between Israel and Arab states, and there's a lot of contention towards Israel's north in Lebanon. And so we are going to bring a lot of these details together, I think, in, in hopefully a fascinating way for you uh, on today's program. What we're going to do through it is focus on a uh, World Tomorrow program that Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong gave back in 1983, on December 2nd, 1983. He was in Jerusalem at the time. Well, he just got back from Jerusalem, and he, ha he had met with a number of leaders in Israel as he was, as he was accustomed to do. Mr. Armstrong's love for Israel and Jerusalem uh, went back decades, and he really did have a powerful uh, relationship with so many leaders, so many leaders of the Jewish state, be them prime ministers or presidents. On this visit, he was going to meet with the Speaker of the Knesset, Speaker of the Knesset. So this is this is kind of, if we could put it in U.S. Uh, US terms, I'm Australian, so I'm not very good with U.S. terms, um, but I think it would be someone like Nancy Pelosi, um, uh, that type of level, the figurehead. The Knesset is obviously the, 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 the legislative body uh, for the Israeli government or the Israeli people. And so he's going to met, meet with a powerful individual and meet in the Knesset, the fortress of Israel's democracy, as this man would call it, and it would be allowed to be filmed. And this film would be, would be shown on the uh, World Tomorrow broadcast about a, a month later, I believe it was, or a few weeks later, as he got back to, um, got back to Pasadena. And I want to show this because, and I want to show it at length, because the situation that Mr. Armstrong described to this individual, this leader, um, it, it, it's, it's remarkable because the themes are taking place right now in terms of biblical prophecy, what's happening. And of course, Mr. Armstrong's solution to the difficulties faced by Israel and in the region are totally different, uh, totally different to the human solutions being worked out even today. And these problems that he's going to discuss with this leader have persisted to our time. Uh, and in a way, it's it's like there's a little snapshot of what was going on 30 years ago. And the, the major themes of what are taking place right now in terms of events in the Middle East um, were touched on by Mr. Armstrong. So what I want to do first is just read the bio that this man, the Speaker of the House, um, his name uh, is Menachem Savador, and uh, he he's obviously chairs the he chairs the government of the Knesset. So he's part of the ruling coalition at the time. So he represents the government, and he asked for a little bit of a bio uh, before Mr. Armstrong's visit. This is the bio that he received back on October seventeenth. Uh, 1983, just a month and a half before Mr. Armstrong visited. We we reached out to the uh, Knesset archivist a couple of years ago to try and hunt down anything in the Knesset archives of Mr. Armstrong. And interestingly enough, this was one of the things that, that turned up. And so this is somebody from Israel that's familiar with Mr. Armstrong writing to the Speaker of the House saying, this is the man that you're going to meet inside the Knesset. It's, it's, we're unsure whether he had met him before. Nevertheless, this is what it said. 
uh, her subject, Herbert Armstrong, as you requested, the following are details about Mr. Armstrong for whom and his entourage you are set a meeting with the Knesset chairman for Tuesday. So this is the meeting that's about to, that's going to happen uh, on on the 25th, uh, a week after this point, actually. Sorry, the program was aired a month, a couple months after Mr. Armstrong uh, met him a week after this memo was sent. Herbert Armstrong, now 90 years old, is president of Ambassador College in Pasadena, California, and also head of a fundamentalist church with millions of members, mostly in the Western United States. He didn't have millions of members. Uh, it's interesting because this isn't written by somebody that belonged to Mr. Armstrong's organization. This was a someone that lived in Israel that knew of him, uh, somebody from the Jerusalem Foundation, it was called. It says, he loves Israel. He loves Israel. They could recognize this. Contributing in the past and continuing to contribute today substantial amounts to Israel and mostly to Jerusalem. The projects in Jerusalem established with his great and varied help, chiefly the contributions to miscellaneous archaeological efforts in the city, to the city's Tower of David Museum operations, Liberty Bell Park, and Liberty Bell Park as a symbol of Israeli-American friendship. Mr. Armstrong publishes the Ambassador College magazine called Plain Truth, similar in format to Newsweek or to Time. The magazine, which appears in three languages, is given free of charge and has a circulation of around 7 million copies. In his earlier visits to Israel, Mr. Armstrong met with previous presidents, Mr. Shazar, who's deceased, Mr. Katsir, and Mr. Yavon. Likewise, during his visits to Israel, he met with Israeli Prime Ministers Mrs. Goldemir, Yitzhak Rabin, and Menachem Begin. And so that's quite the quite the the sheet that was given to uh, Menachem Salvador just before Mr. Armstrong, a 90-year-old ind individual, is going to perhaps meet him for the first time and have a sit-down videotaped from the, one of the Knesset side rooms, which Mr. Armstrong said was probably well, the first time that he knew that they allowed a foreign film crew in to film such a meeting with the knowledge that it would be aired all over the world. All over the world, this discussion between a 90-year-old man who had a passion and love for the city of Jerusalem and the Speaker of the Knesset. Maybe you can play uh, the first clip, Richard. You know that uh, we have some basic problems in the Israel economy, and then there are the conjunctural ones. Mm -hmm. The basic problems are that a country is spending one-third of its gross national product on defense, mm -hmm. one-third to pay off debts. Now, we are a coalition government, and the tail is walking the dog. Yes. In other words, every small splinter group is stretching out the uh, arm. They are not arm strong, they are arm weak. Yes. And uh, they ask for uh, money to run their ministries and to prove that they are successful. And since one third of our gross national product is inadequate, to provide all this welfare and education and development, they address themselves to a printing press. I'm simplifying a complicated subject, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Well. So if you know anything about Israel, nothing has changed since Menachem Salvador said this in 1983. You still have a coalition government. You still have the tail moving a wag or whatever he said, tail moving the head, trying to control things. You still have fractured politics to a, just an unbelievable degree. And I think with mostly our two party systems throughout the Western democracies, um, we, we are unfamiliar with just how fractured Israel's parliament is right now. Uh, there was a latest poll that came out yesterday, I think it was yesterday or the day before, and the Likud party, which is the 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 chair that is chaired by or or at least led by uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, his party has sunk in the polls over the whole coronavirus handling, according to the Israeli public. The prime minister didn't do enough, and you have the rise actually of the the, the party on the further right, uh, Naftali Bennett's party. That's only three seats behind him, his party right now. But what's interesting about this also is that even back then, these parties, when they didn't get what they wanted, they just go to the printing press, they go to media, and the media right now in Israel is vehemently anti-Netanyahu. Um, 
it, it puts American media to, to shame even, if, if you look at it in terms of um, negative coverage of President Trump, uh, the, the coverage of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, in the mainstream, he doesn't have a friend apart from perhaps Israel Hayom, which is a relatively new paper um, that was put out to try and just put a different message out from what was what is being heard. And so it's really hard to lead Israel. I live in Israel. I, I have done. I've been here for a few months, but I've lived in Israel for over for over four years. And the bickering amongst the Israeli Knesset uh, and the different political parties is an unsolvable, unsolvable mess. And Mr. Flo- Mr. Armstrong, sorry, is going to get into this um, uh, in the next clip, his, his solution in a way, or at least showing what is really going on. Clip two. Do you know, I see now, as I didn't when I was younger, the trouble in the whole world. And it's the trouble here, it's the trouble in other places, and it's the world trouble. <clears throat> It's every man for himself. People will join together and ally in groups, provided that group can be against some other group. It's person against person, group against group. Two cannot walk together in peace except they be agreed. If there's contention, and if you're in a bad attitude, and one is trying to get the best of the other, or take from the other, you have no basis for peace. Now, that's the trouble in the whole world. Now, if you just consider what Mr. Armstrong said there, he took the example of what was happening inside the fractured Knesset of 1983, and he described the problems that exist everywhere. Problems that exist all over the world and how it gets gets back to a couple of ways of life. And this was famous for Mr. Armstrong to talk about the two ways of life. And he even spends a lot of time later on in this uh, later, later on in this sit down um, with the Speaker of the House of, of Israel, of the Knesset, talking about this. But he simplifies the problem and saying, well, if everyone's trying to get something from each other, there's no basis for peace. There's no way peace can be achieved in a long-standing, uh, in a long-standing and, and 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 strong way when you have that type of attitude. And that attitude, as Mr. Armstrong says, he recognized this when he was younger. He's now in his 90th year, and he's seen it play out over and over and over again in human relations, governmental relations, international relations. It's all the same. There's no peace because two can't be ag- uh, walk together unless they be agreed. There is this nature of man, as he's going to talk about uh, later on, um, that makes it impossible to bring lasting, lasting peace. Now, if we could just uh, go to the next clip, just wait one second, uh, Richard. Um, I'll just set this up. Mr. Armstrong had just come from Jordan. He had a really close ties with the King of Jordan. Uh, he had projects inside Jordan, humanitarian projects, uh, and he had... Again, a close close relationship with the king. I don't think he met with the king on this this prior visit. However, he, Mr. Armstrong, was was often a go between between Arab governments and uh, Israel. If you look back to the late seventies, he was very he had very much a role to play between Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat of Egypt and and bringing about uh, that that peace peace agreement there. And perhaps there would be something on the horizon for Jordan. This, of course, is 1983. Jordanian peace didn't, well, Jordanian, the peace treaty between Israel and Jordan didn't take place until 1994. But notice what Mr. Armstrong says in reaction to Mr. Um, Salvador's question. Clip three. How did you, did you find any, uh, any esprit ouvert, what we say in French, any open heartedness, uh, and, uh, and uh, a new spirit that we could engage in a dialogue and hammer out a settlement between uh, us and our cousins. Last time I talked with King Hussein was last March, and I told him that one thing that I would like to do would be to get him and Mr. Begin together on my jet aircraft And I said, I know Mr. Begin would like to do it, and I know you would, if. And he began to laugh, and he said, yes, I would, if. (laughs) 
the if is the other Arab nations and what they would say about it. So this is really interesting because if you fast forward to what we've seen today, this if is kind of being resolved, at least temporarily, as we've seen it. Other Arab nations right now are falling in line with a position that looks to be pro-Israeli. And so Mr. Armstrong talks about how Jordan would maybe do this in a really, in a way that he saw as being a legitimate overture towards peace by the king. But he was worried because Jordan's a small country, what the other Arab states, uh, other Arab states would say about it. And this really does bring us forward to what's happening What's happening right now when you do have other Arab states led by the UAE, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and now Bahrain that have signed peace accords with Israel. Peace accords with Israel. But what's interesting about these peace accords that if Mr. Armstrong was alive today, I don't think that he would be celebrating them because these aren't uh, peace overtures of, let's say, a longstanding value where there is is not a quid pro quo that's going on in the background. And while, again, this is a cause to be celebrated, I, I should say, when any anyone is making an overture towards peace, these nations that Israel is allying with right now, while it looks like they have peaceful intentions, we can look to the Bible and understand what the future of these peace agreements would be. Right now, if you're Israeli, you're looking at the world, you're looking how Arabs... Uh, the the sons of uh, sons of Ishmael um, are actually coming to you wanting a peace deal, peace deals peace agreements and this can be a, a very much a time for ease or a time for celebration or a time for comfort in the environment in the Middle East remember the Jewish state's been there since 1948 that's a long time that's a long time for the state to be there and they've fought numerous wars against Arab states that wanted to absolutely destroy them. And so when you see a state say, okay, we're going to accept you into our environment, this is a cause for a celebration amongst Israelis. But what Mr. Armstrong knew and what our editor-in-chief, Mr. Gerald Flurry, has shown is that even these peace deals are very much flawed. And this has, Mr. Mr. Flurry gave a program about this. I think it's called Psalm 83 Alliance. This was, I think, two or three weeks ago. And it goes through some of the dangers, some of the dangers of this peace deal. Peace deal between Arab states and Israel based on biblical prophecy, this prophecy found in Psalm chapter 83. And it's amazing to see what has come out after the deal was supposedly broken in on December 2nd, the UAE is hoping that the United States is going to be ready to sign a deal with them to receive the F-35 fighter jet. F-35 fighter jet, fighter jet is the premier jet that the United States has. Israel has some of them right now. Israel has been using them for the past couple of years inside Syria. They have the ability, these jets, to go into foreign airspace without being detected. And so... Uh, and carrying, obviously, lots of munitions as well. And so what's what's really interesting about this, and Richard's pulling up an article I wrote about it. You could read this if you want, Arming Israel's Future Enemy. Um, this kind of goes into these details. But <clears throat> here you have a supposed peace deal with Israel when they're coming together to sign in some type of brotherhood of man. And behind closed doors, there's a secret side deal of this one, this Trump agreement, that is going to give the F-35 to the potential enemy of the Jewish state. And this should be a cause for concern. Mr. Flurry has said that this type of deal is not going to end well. And is it true that the United States is arming the future enemy of the state of Israel with F-35s? I mean... You can just look at this. This is going to be their celebration. National Day is uh, is um, like their Independence Day, I suppose. The UAE's Independence Day on, on December 2nd. They're going to be celebrating that. And they're hoping to celebrate it with this, this peace deal and their National Day with what they're getting. And what are they getting? They're getting weapons of warfare. They're getting the most sophisticated plane in the world. And this should be celebrated? This, this peace agreement. 
Now, of course, right now they don't, and they're not intent, and I don't think the, the Crown Prince, uh, MBZ, is, is intent on using it on Israel, but we have to look to biblical prophecy to understand where these deals are going. And biblical prophecy says, on, uh, based on Psalm 83, and you can definitely watch that Key of David, it says that this alliance coming together right now between these Arab states and Israel is going to backfire on Israel quite a lot. And Mr. Flurry, in that program, he focuses on another player that isn't really visible as part of this alliance just yet, and that is the nation of Germany. But there was something very interesting that happened over the past couple of days, or in fact just yesterday, inside Germany. Uh, this is an article entitled, Never Again, UAE's Top Diplomat Declares at Holocaust Memorial with Ashkenazi. So this is from the Times of Israel. Um, so... What you've got and what you had on Tuesday was a visit to the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. You had the foreign ministers of three countries there, Germany, Heiko Maas. Uh, you had the foreign minister of uh, the UAE, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed al-Nahyan, butchering that. And then Gabi Ashkenazi, which is uh, Israel's, Israel's foreign minister. And they are going to look through the Holocaust Memorial. Now, if you know Psalm 83, this is kind of terrifying. You, you know that Germany has a history with, and that's what they're viewing, they have a history at putting to death Jews. And you know, based on this prophecy in Psalm 83, that in the future, they're going to want to do that same thing to Jerusalem uh, with these Arab states that Israel is now partnering. This is just a couple of quotes from this article. Um Israel's Gabi Ashkenazi, UAE counterpart, counterpart, bumped elbows instead of shaking hands in line with measures to halt the spread of the coronavirus as they met face to face for the first time after their countries signed a US brokered deal in mid September. So they're brokering a deal and in September, and they haven't met before. And where are they meeting first? They are meeting at the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. And they both, there's some video of this. So they, they both walked around. Everyone was socially distanced. Everyone was wearing face masks, of, masks, of course. They wrote in Arabic and, and uh, Hebrew inside the uh, kind of the, the diary of their, the record of them coming there. Um, but notice this quote towards the end of, of this article. I think this was said briefly thereafter. Yeah. At a, at a press conference, He's talking at these two are meeting together and, and Ashkenazi says, uh, well, Mas says, the, 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 the foreign minister Billy, and this shows that peaceful existence in the Middle East is possible. So they think peace in the Middle East is possible through this. Uh, and then I'll just continue on. This is the article now itself. Political conflicts have, this is towards the end of that article, political conflicts have led to fierce tensions between Islam and Judaism, and the Holocaust denial is rampant in many Arab countries. Mas called it a great honor that Israeli and Emirati foreign ministers picked Berlin as the site for their historic first meeting. Quote, the most important currency in diplomacy is trust, is trust. And I'm personally thankful to both my colleagues that they are placing this trust in Germany. And so for those that have been listening, listen to that Key of David, those that have the Watch Jerusalem magazine, uh, some of you do, this is, uh, it's called, this we just came out this this month. The title is Peace with Arabs, Can It, Can it Happen? And Mr. Flurry's article is, is written by that same, very same title. And he talks about this prophecy in Psalm 83, talking about how you, it's going to involve the moderate Arab states, moderate right now, UAE is going to be one of them, and it's going to involve Germany. And they're going to come together and make crafty counsel with one another. These are a couple of verses from Psalm 83. We're just going to read verse uh, 3 to 5. I think it's verse 3 to 5. It's written in the JPS in, in this, what I'm reading from. Uh, you'll see where it is. It's, For lo, for lo your enemies are in uproar, this is the JPS translation, and they they hate you, they that hate you have lifted up your head. They hold cross, crafty converse or counsel against your people and take counsel against the treasured ones. They have said, this group of nations, which includes the Ishmaelites, which the UAE and the Saudis acknowledge that that is their forefather, 
and Germany, this is what they say, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in, in remembrance. So this is an alliance that happens, has never happened before, has never taken place before, Psalm 83. Most of, it's, most of the Psalms aren't prophecy. This one is. It's never happened before. It's involving the UAE and other moderate Arab states. And it involves Germany. And it says that they're taking crafty counsel, deceitful counsel against Israel, against the state of Israel. This is implying this is implying that Israel is going to trust in these nations, that they're going to have a warm relationship with these nations, and that eventually, though, there's going to be a double cross against Israel. Are we seeing that? Are we seeing that? I mean, Mas just quoted, I'm thankful that Israel and the UAE put their trust in Germany to the point, to the point that they would have their first visit to showcase their true peace here in Germany with me with us. And yet, biblical prophecy says that these nations are going to be the ones that start marching on Jerusalem. And Mr. Mr. Armstrong even does talk about that as he continues to go. He uses obviously a little bit more of coded language, but you can see where he is, he is going, uh, going to. Uh, I think you, if you, Richard, if you can uh, spl uh, skip to clip number five, go there for this. But I tell you, this is only going to be solved one way. And we humans aren't going to solve it. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is going to have to solve it for us. And it will be solved. And it won't be long now. And it will be done. I don't mean a year or so, but I don't mean another hundred years either. We're in a crisis at the close of all civilization in this world. And the very hub of the whole world crisis is right here. Well, and things are going to happen here to Jerusalem. So you have Mr. Armstrong that is going to that is saying that peace is only possible uh, the, with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are called the Abraham Accords, um, but Abraham isn't in it, as Mr. Ar Mr. Flurry brings out in his program. How about the faith of Abraham? Following that, trusting not in princes for your security, as the Psalm says. This is not what Israel is doing in this case at all. They're they're trusting in princes. They're trusting in alliances. Something that is shaky. Uh, and that's in the Bible as well. But then Mr. Armstrong says, some, and things are going to happen here in Jerusalem. And this is pretty hard hitting because probably what's in his mind is, is Psalm 83. Probably what's in his mind also is other prophecies in Daniel chapter 11, which talks about na these, these, these um, foreign armies that are going to march on Jerusalem. He's thinking about what Europe is going to do to Jerusalem in the future. The Bible is all through, uh, has these prophecies all through it. And then he's going to go on and talk about Europe, talk about what's happening in Europe. And we are still waiting for the full formation of this. But when you see the UAE foreign minister meeting with the German foreign minister, thinking about how wonderful the relationship is with Israel, you know that these relation, that this prophecy is, is of Europe's rise to form part of this Psalm 83 alliance. The critical factor in the Psalm 83 alliance is very close. You can go to clip six now. Now, one thing I can tell you you're going to see big events take place in Europe very soon. I'm in touch personally with the men that are leading in a movement to unite Europe, reunite. Well, in the Christian times, and it they can't understand why they're not making better progress right now. Franz Josef Strauss. Uh, Otto von Habsburg, are friends of mine, and they're working for a united Europe. 
and it's going to happen sooner than they realize. Uh, Mr. Hofburg came to Pasadena to see me about two months ago. And he was a little discouraged that they're not making faster progress. Something is going to happen to force a new united Europe that will be a nation as strong and as powerful, if not maybe more so, than either the Soviet Union or the United States. Now, our people in the United States don't believe that. Nobody believes it. But biblical prophecy says it's going to happen. And mark my words, it will happen. And I'm not speaking just like a wild-eyed fanatic that doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, and it's going to affect Israel over here very seriously. And so uh, there, right at the end, Mr. Armstrong says there is going to be a rising Europe and it's going to affect Israel very seriously. Prophecies in the Bible, especially Hosea chapter 5, uh, it talks about how Israel is going to trust in Germany so much that they are going to reach out to Germany to come and save them uh, in the future. They're going to reach out to their the perpetrator of the Holocaust in the near future to come and save them. That's how bad the situation would be for Israel, and the Germans are going to oblige, and that is what's they're going to lead to a big uh, double cross in the future. And and well, Mr. Armstrong wasn't there to to preach doom and gloom. He certainly said, based on the Bible, the events that are going to happen, and it just strikes me to an amazing degree that here you have not a religious man, Salvador, he's sitting there and he's he's listening to a 90-year-old American um, who's giving him the word and the prophecies of the Bible. They're going to happen. A lot of people think in America that is that Europe's never going to rise, but it will happen. Mr. Armstrong believed these prophecies. He said as much, I'm not speaking like a wild-eyed fanatic that doesn't know what he's talking about. He had a life based on biblical prophecy, and that was going to eventually impact Israel. They don't know what it's going to be that unites Europe, he said just then. They're waiting for some force to do it, or at least waiting for that to happen, have a good idea of what it would be. But nevertheless, Mr. Armstrong said it was bound to happen. I think I just want to go back now, and we'll catch up with clip four. Before you play that, though, this is a little bit earlier in the discussion, and it jumps to Lebanon that's currently embroiled in, in the civil war at this point, um, the Lebanese civil war. And Lebanon, of course, is just to Israel's north. Lebanon has been in the news a lot uh, since the, the Beirut uh, blast back on August 4th. That nation has not recovered at all. And it plays into this prophecy in Psalm chapter 83 quite a lot as well. And notice what Salvador says the problem is um, inside Lebanon. Clip four. In order to address yourself to the Lebanese uh, uh, entanglement, you have to attack the uh, fundamental issues and you should not divorce yourself from the historical basic data about this country. So they have a national pact that the president should be a Christian the Prime Minister is a Muslim, the President of the, pro of the uh, Parliament is a Muslim Shiite, and so forth. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, on this, uh, in this animosity and this ethnical mosaic that you have in Lebanon, with Soviet communist agents inside, yes. And the wrangling and bickering and the skirmishes between them the encourage the Soviets all resuscitating all the time. It is, I am afraid, a very, very unpleasant task. Yes. Almost uh, immaterial, immaterializable. I don't know how they are going to. Uh... Well, we are living in a turbulent world. So he's bringing up Lebanon there that was currently embroiled in, in the civil war. And he, he, Salvador says that the country is such because of its sectarian divisions, meaning there's a lots of different people that make up Lebanon, that it is a, he calls it an ethnic mosaic, 
that how you're going to bring these 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 groups together because of their political system, because somebody has to be, the, the speaker has to be a Shiite, because uh, the, the, pr- the prime minister has to be a Sunni, uh, because the president has to be a Christian, because there's Druze, because there's, you know, the different variety of, of Muslims that live there. These different ethnicities, they have created a constitution that is fundamentally flawed, that perpetuates sectarian divisions. It perpetuates unrest. It perpetuates violence. It perpetuates cronyism. When you have these certain sects that have to make up certain parts of the of the parliament, a certain ratio of the parliament has to be Christian and things like that. There is a fundamental problem about it, and that needs to be changed, is basically what he's saying if, if Lebanon is to go forward. And so if since 1983 to now, Lebanon has not gone forward, <laughs> has not gone forward at all. And even going back to October 2019, massive protests taking place because the people themselves are sick of this system. They're sick of their system of government, which over time for the past decade has led to the power of Hezbollah, which is the Iranian-backed group, Iranian-backed, affiliated with the Shiites as well. This is an article from October 6, just from yesterday. And this is from Michael Young, one of the best writers on Lebanon. His article is entitled, Can Lebanon Survive As It Is? Can Lebanon survive as it is with the political configuration that it... it, of how it is how it is uh, built up and has been for the past 30 so years. Just the first sentence here, much attention in recent recent weeks weeks has been focused on the on the aborted formation of a new government according to a roadmap laid out by French president Emmanuel Macron. Yet in his press conference on September 27 related to the situation in Lebanon, Macron said something else that surely registered with many Lebanese when he mentioned the possibility of a political recomposition in Lebanon. Okay, Lebanon's a tiny country. Five or six million people, million Syrian refugees. It, it's been a basket case for decades. Why is it important? We've been writing about how Lebanon is actually going to side with these moderate Arab states as part of the Psalm 83 alliance. And right now, it's held at to ransom by Iran's power by virtue of Hezbollah. But we expect that to change. We expect Hezbollah's power, though it has 150 missiles pointing at Israel right now, though it has been held the seat of power for almost a decade in that country by virtue of this corrupt political system that gives it outsized uh, political power, that's going to change based on Psalm 83. We know it's going to change. And we wrote about this and how this blast massive explosion to the degree that it just has not been captured uh, on with footage, um, let's say in recent in recent memory, one that wasn't a test of any type, that is going to cause or lead to the change in Lebanon's government that is going to see Hezbollah and Iranian power booted from the country. Now that sounds crazy to almost everybody that knows the situation in Lebanon in terms in terms of um, how powerful Hezbollah is and how powerful Iran is. But this article, and he's basically saying, Michael Young saying, well, Macron is calling for the bust up of our political system. Something new has to happen. And Hezbollah is obviously going to resist this because the political system works for Hezbollah's power over Lebanon. Now, you have had recently the Christian uh, patriarch of the Maronite Church. Christians make up 40% of Lebanon, little known fact of anyone outside the region. So it's a heavily Christian country. And the Shiites make up about 30%. So the Christians actually outnumber the Shiites at least. And But the Christians have been in an alliance for a number of years with the Shiites, with Hezbollah. They rule. Hezbollah rules by virtue of its partnership with the Christians. But you have the patriarch of the Maronite, that's the variety of Christianity that's an offshoot of Catholicism, is coming out and saying, we need to change the system as well. Macron's saying it, and so is the patriarch of the Christians. So where does this leave Lebanon? This is towards the end, the fifth last paragraph here. And this is, again, Michael Young. He writes, so what is left? So what is left that the political class will allow? Nothing comes immediately to mind. Since last October... 
Uh, Hezbollah has trapped itself by refusing to give any ground to popular protest in Lebanon and by bolstering the politicians. However, in doing so, it has provoked a gradual disintegration of the system it was trying to prop up. Widespread popular anger and social and a social situation in Lebanon that makes makes the parties contract with Iran to act as a deterrent against Israel far more difficult to implement. If things continue along this path, Lebanon may conceivably enter into a period of civil strife that threatens Hezbollah's interest even more. In stubbornly resisting all options, the party may be bringing about the very situation its most vociferous enemies had sought to impose on Hezbollah, an internal conflict that would neutralize it as a tool of Iran. So you've got probably one of the best speakers coming out and saying, oh, Hezbollah is pushing this pretty hard. If they continue to push this, they're going to be out of power. There might be civil strife. There might be civil war in Lebanon. And this is something based on Psalm 83 and the political situation that our editor-in-chief has actually talked about happening um, back almost a decade ago. And so the, the situation in Lebanon has a human, a human solution, busting up the constitution, the French proposal coming in, Hezbollah getting out. Biblical prophecy says that's going to happen. Biblical prophecy says it also is not, though, going to lead to peace. And Mr. Armstrong does talk about that as he goes uh, through, this, um, through this message with Menachem Salvador. I do want to pull ahead now to clip eight because I want to make sure we get this. Now, this clip, this goes on for about six minutes. So if you've stuck with me to this long, thank you. Uh, but this is the clip I want you to really, really take away. Imagine this. Imagine a religious leader going to the Knesset and somebody that's given so much to Israel and saying this and the person sitting there looking him in the eye and listening to what Mr. Armstrong has to say. This is clip eight. It all gets back to a way of life, a way of life. There is a law, and law merely, now you're a lawmaking man, the Knesset is a lawmaking body. I spoke before the uh, constitutional uh, law department at the University of California in their law school. And I was mentioning that law is merely the rules to regulate human conduct. It's a way of life. The law of God is love, which is outflowing regard and concern for the good and welfare of others as well as yourself and equal to yourself. And we don't have that in this world. We have a law operating in this world, and that law is vanity. I love me, I don't care about you. Every man for himself, I want everything for me, but I'm going to disagree with you. It's competition instead of cooperation. Instead of cooperation and unity in the right attitude and spirit, we find people joining together in conflict with other groups, one group against another. Now, in World War II, the United States and Britain were fighting against Germany. Now they try to ally with Germany against Russia. In World War II, the United States was allied with Russia against Germany. And we, we, we ally, and then we change our allies, alliances. And we don't see it all gets back to a basic attitude of mind and way of living. Now, I see that God's way is wanting to help, wanting to share. Now, oh, that's the way we do. We come to Israel. We don't ask anything of Israel. We're not trying to get anything here. You can't find a single friend of ours over here that'll tell you I've ever tried to get anything here. I come here to give. And I, you can check that all you want well, to, and you'll find that's true. And when people can get into that attitude, we'll begin to have world peace. 
Now, we're not going to have that until, you know, the Bible also prophesies a Messiah is going to come. And it is going to happen, and we are going to have world peace. We're not going to have it man's way as long as man wants to organize as he's doing this group against that group, this nation against that nation, this individual against that individual. It just can't be. You're right. As for us, we're not going to solve the world problems right now. And as for us, meaning the work that I'm doing, not the United States, we love Israel, we love the people of Israel, and we come here in peace to help to give, to share. We know we're not going to bring peace now. I, My job is to proclaim the way of peace, not to accomplish peace, but to proclaim the way of the Almighty God who's going to accomplish it and going to do it to us, whether we like it or whether we don't. He is going to compel people to have peace. Well, and it's going great. to take force. It's going to take a force greater than human force. And in the meantime, we just try to have as much peace as we can. Now, I'm a friend of Arab people, a friend of the Israelis, a friend of the Japanese, a friend of black people in Africa, and we have projects in all of these countries. And we know we're not going to bring peace, but we believe we should do what we can toward peace in the meantime. And I proclaim the way of peace. Now, if that's the first time you've seen that, that's probably kind of startling. If you know about the history of Mr. Armstrong and his love for Israel, just seeing the reverence that this Speaker of the House, a politician, Israelis are not known for uh, <laughs> not interrupting. Just listen to him talk about how this world is on the wrong foundation. This world's on the wrong foundation and it has to be changed. There's going to be no peace. Menachem Salvador presents problems. He said, uh, Israel's good democracy, it's, it's, you know, it's all so uh, uh, fractured. Nothing can ever get done. They go, to the, they go to the press and blab about this, that, and the other thing. He brings up the potential for Arab-Israeli peace. Mr. Armstrong says, not going to happen in the, in the long run. Man can't bring that about. He talks about the Lebanese problem. And Mr. Armstrong says, well, you know, man's not going to be able to solve that either. And yet, this is a hopeful message. He said that God, the Messiah, is coming. He said this to the speaker of the Israeli Knesset out of love for the Israeli people, as he said, the Messiah is coming and he's going to compel us to have peace. Contel compel mankind to have peace, if you, can, if you can even imagine that. Man right now is not set up with the ability to create peace by itself. There has to be a change of the human heart. And Mr. Armstrong was addressing that and he was bold and he was bold, not just to him, there's, there's pictures and, and history of Mr. Armstrong and the prime ministers all through uh, the old worldwide Church of God uh, material and also on our website, Watch Jerusalem. We've got a lot of those pictures as well. He's in bear hugs with these men. Menachem Begin, he's there hugging him. Menachem Begin said if Mr. Armstrong came at two or three o'clock in the morning, uh, he would you know, get up in the middle of the night and go see him down in Tel Aviv if he could. There was a love that these Israeli leaders had for Mr. Armstrong because Mr. Armstrong practiced the way of give and he loved Jerusalem. He loved this. He, he loved the Israeli people. He understood their potential in the end, but he still told them. He still told them how that type of peace was going to come about. He was called an ambassador for world peace. He proclaimed the way of peace, but he knew he wasn't going to bring it about. He knew that only God could bring it about. And right now, um, lots of us, all of us in the Philadelphia Church of God, are celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, as you've heard so much about 
this time that does uh, an event, this feast that, that pitches every single year, a thousand years of peace that is shortly coming. Now, those prophecies are going to take place. The Psalm 83 alliance is going to come together. The Psalm 83 alliance with Arab states alongside Germany are going to warm up to Israel to the point that Israel actually invites them into their country to help out with some issues. And they're going to turn their back on Israel. That is still going to happen. But there will be shortly thereafter the fulfillment of this peace. Peace, finally, brought by God. Not by a little quid pro quo. You come and sign a peace deal with us. Here, have some F-35 so you can go and fight more people. That's not peace. Mankind should be sick of trying to solve peace or trying to get peace his own way because it just hasn't happened, but God is going to bring it upon us. I am going to just quote from the very beginning of The Wonderful World Tomorrow. This is a booklet that you should request uh, because it talks about the state of our world today. And then it talks about what The Wonderful World Tomorrow is going to be like, what this Feast of Tabernacles is pictured by. This is how it begins. You don't have to believe it. It will happen regardless. I'm sure the world's only sure hope. It is sure, sorry, the world's only sure hope. This advanced good news of tomorrow is as certain as the rising of tomorrow's sun. And that's what these prophecies show us. The prophecies show us, that's why we focus on it, that this time is coming. It's leading to this. Humanity won't bring it about. Bring it about. It's going to be done to us. Humanity is going to be forced to be happy, to enjoy world peace, to see universal abundance and joy fill the earth. Utopia? Why not? Why should it be an imaginary or impossible pipe dream? There is a cause for today's world chaos and threat of human extinction. That cause will be supplanted by that which will bring a utopia that is real and that is successfully functioning. It's going to happen. As Mr. Armstrong told Menachem Salvador back there in 1983, and as this world is being told again right now uh, through the work of the Philadelphia Church of God and, and Mr. Mr. Gerald Flurry. Now, just as we conclude, I do want to go to a, the final clip. This is right at the end. And um, after Mr. Armstrong says, I proclaim the way of peace, you notice that Menachem Savabur was kind of fidgeting. I don't think he was getting nervous at this. I mean, he said, you're right, Mr. Armstrong, we can't bring uh, peace by ourselves, given the situations he said in that previous clip. But then he's going to give Mr. Armstrong an award after this speech. Here's clip nine. Well, Mr. Armstrong, I am, uh, first of all, very privileged to have you in my office, in the fortress of Israel's democracy. Mm -hmm. May I uh, just uh, present you with the Medal of the Knesset. It uh, features uh, the building and then the uh, sites of the monotheistic, three monotheistic faces that Jerusalem uh, is uh, holy to them. Mm -hmm. So here is the medal which shows Jerusalem for which you have done so much and the Knesset, the only fortress of democracy in the Middle East. And here is what I say to the Honorable Mr. Herbert Armstrong in appreciation of his true friendship for the land and people of Israel and his magnanimous gestures which aid and strengthen the spiritual and moral tenets of our common culture, Menachem Savidor, Speaker of the Knesset, with my best wishes. Oh, thank you so much. So after that half an hour or so interview, they award him with the Medal of the Knesset. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong, for your magnanimous gestures towards world peace and helping out the state of Israel. We appreciate it, and we also appreciate somebody that just tells them the truth tells them the truth about what's going to happen and the biblical prophecies that are going to take place. Just one final quote. This is the Eternal Has Chosen Jerusalem book. This, uh, if you're attending the Feast of Tabernacles, you probably got your hands on a copy. If you're not attending the feast, get your hands on a copy. I think it'll be up on, on the trumpet.com pretty soon. Just one quote here to finish. 
What love and excitement Mr. Armstrong had for Jerusalem, even Jerusalem today. He had an infectious vision and excitement, and his love for this city and its people inspired affection and admiration in those with whom he met. He was an example for us. And if you want to be enraptured by this same vision that Mr. Armstrong had, that you can see that he really believed the things he's telling the Speaker of the House. He really did believe that God and the Messiah is Messiah is going to bring about this world peace, that we cannot solve our problems, and that the vision of what is going to happen in Jerusalem in the near future as the headquarters of God's kingdom um, if you want to be inspired by that vision, a necessary vision for you to get through what's coming and the difficult times that we have do have ahead to see that hope-filled future, please do go ahead and, and request this booklet uh, hot off the press by, from Mr. Gerald Flurry, The Eternal is Chosen Jerusalem. Thank you very much for staying with us uh, all the way to the end, if you did. And thank you very much for Mr. Stephen Flurry uh, for letting me have the program and for Richard as well for making your screen screen seem uh, very interesting as well. The feedback, if you'd like to send some of that, I believe the email I wrote on a different piece of paper, it's for you to send feedback to Mr. Flurry on the program, to perhaps to me uh, on this program. The email is td at kpcg.fm. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>